atomic submarines begins a desperate search for an unknown enemy whose destruction of polar shipping has the nation's back against the wall. See the mysterious blasting of an atomic sub by this dreadful unseen adversary. The USS Tiger Shark, our last hope. See it fire an intercontinental ballistics missile from under the ice at the North Pole. Even at this very moment, the entire world awaits the countdown that will send the first living person hurtling into the unexplored mysteries of the universe. Three, two, one, drop. Y-13, commence your turn immediately. No, sir, I'm going straight up. First man into space. Can science prepare him for what no man has ever experienced before? Will the hypnotic effects of weightlessness or dread anoxia lure him beyond all human control? I wanted to be the first man into space. Is this the end? Lifeless man and his machine orbiting the Earth forever? Or what if he is the first man to return from space? Every man who challenges the unknown risks far more than science knows or conjectures. What will unpredictable cosmic forces do to the human body? What thing of unknown terror may return to walk the earth?
15,000 feet, climbing steadily. Check, 15,000 feet. Radar scanning correctly, sir. Under to control. Y-12 pilot, turn three now. Y-12 to control. Are you reading me? Testing. Over. Reading you loud and clear. Switch on your instrument transmitters now. Over. Control, control. I'm switching on now. Over. Check your recorders. Are you receiving signals correctly? Motor recorder OK. Beam director checking OK, sir. Pilot's heartbeat steady, sir. Air friction recorder working correctly, sir. Electronic brain and gyros recording correctly, sir. Preparing to drop Y-12, 45,000 feet. Check. Ready and waiting your countdown. Detached and airborne, firing rocket motors. Controllability barrier. It will be difficult for him. Control the Y-12. Control the Y-12. Do you read me? Y-12 to control. Reading you loud and clear. Over. You are approaching controllability barrier. Steady as you're going. Hold on tight. Steady. He's made it. God, a big achievement. 
great. Pilot's heart beats steady, sir. Pilot's pulse checking OK. Control to Y-12. Control to Y-12. Do you read me, over? Y-12 to control. All sign of G pressure gone. We have you at 230,000 feet. Check. Check. Now, hold on, boy. You're reaching the ionosphere. Your motor will burn out in exactly five seconds. Check. Four. Three. Two. That's the burnout. He's OK. Maximum test height of 300,000 feet. You're in modified atmosphere. She's riding steady. Feel as though I could go on. Test your controls and prepare to turn. Let her go, Chuck. See what you'll do. Everything's all right, Doctor? Heartbeat is almost normal. But with release of pressures, judgment may be unsound for some seconds. Should I take over on remote control? No, give him a few more seconds. Dan, do you hear me? I repeat. towards stabilizers. Steady me. Steady me. Electronic controls take all stabilizers. Try, sir, if they can't get equalization. Keep that. Listen, Dan. This is Dr. Van Essen speaking. You are weightless. Tell me what to do, Doc. Tell me what to do. First, control yourself. Now, forget everything else and watch your left hand. Without taking your eyes off it, put it down until it is resting on something, no matter what. Take your time. Be quick, Doctor. If the atmosphere at this speed, will burn up. When you have hold with your left hand, do the same with your right. Bring it slowly forward until you can grasp the stabilizer. Watch carefully until you are steady. Now concentrate and you will regain control of Y-12. You're moving outside the preset radar position. We're going to lose you. Can't help it, can't help it. I've got control, but I can't reduce speed. Radar control, Y-12 gliding outside preset orbit. Track five degrees west. Tracking five degrees west, sir. Oh, holy bug, it's going. His only chance is to bounce the atmosphere until he loses enough speed. Radar control, yes, keep sir. tracking west. Track west, keep going. Keep going. Keep tracking.
pal. If you don't hear soon, we never will. Why didn't he obey orders, stick to the test plan? I should have. You cannot blame your brother for this tragedy, Commander Prescott. For a few vital seconds, he was not himself. I wish I could agree with you, Doctor. We do not yet understand the physiological conditions a man may have to endure at such heights. My brother's always been unpredictable. He's a heck of a good pilot, the best we ever had. Well, he knew the limits. Why did he disobey orders? It was a physiological condition clouding his judgment. Chuck, we progressed a long way in the development of aviation medicine, but the conditions we simulate in the high altitude test chamber just aren't the real thing. Captain Richards' office, Commander Prescott speaking. What? Right. Is the pilot all right? Now, where? Say that again slowly. Puerco, yes, yes, I know the place between Albuquerque and Santa Fe. Yes, so don't let anyone near it. We'll be right over. We found Y-12, sir, badly damaged, but in one piece. And Lieutenant Prescott, is he safe? Yes, he's all right. Yes, sir? Have Hyatt bring around my car on the double. Salvage officer speaking. Captain Richards, team up the Y-12 crew. Get them loaded and have a salvage crane follow me to Puerco. I'll radio directions, but get going. Hello, Commander. Looks like you're losing me another night's sleep. Very so, sir. Commander Prescott, U.S. Navy. Horse plane. Just off the road over there. We're sure glad to see you. We're mighty cold and hungry. You know. Should have been off duty a couple hours ago. Well, thanks for sticking around. Where's the pilot? Oh, he's around here someplace. The plane's just over here. All right, thanks. Take it easy, Clancy. It's me, Whitney. I brought the Navy. <laughs> what in, a land yacht? <laughs> See so you come down? Yeah, right down the valley. We took a quick look and radioed into headquarters. Where's the pilot? The relief patrol took him into town. Into town? But he's okay. Sure. He looked like a man from Mars in that get up. Talk sense, but he acted kind of loony. What do you mean? I don't know. Kind of high, I guess. But I'll tell you one thing. I'll send in a report to you in the morning, sir. Fine. Well, she's badly beaten up, but with any luck, the instruments might be okay. Let's hope so. Good evening, sir. Boy, that part is the zaniest guy I ever saw. How come? Well, he had me take him into town for a change of clothes. Said he had some dame to see. Couldn't even wait for coffee. I guess I know where that'll be. Mind if I borrow the car, Skipper? Sure. We'll ride back to the salvage crew. Thank you, sir. Take it easy. I wish you were not a test pilot. It is so dangerous. Honey, it's my future. It's our future. Who's going to forget the first man in space? They don't forget Lindbergh or the Wright brothers. You talk too much. You can always shut me up. I will. Oh, don't talk of the macaroni. Answer the door. Is Lieutenant Prescott here? Yes. In there. But... Hiya, brother. Have a drink. What the heck's the matter with you? 
You just wrecked ten million dollars worth of aircraft and I find you lollygagging around here. Why aren't you back at the base making out your report? As a matter of fact, I was just on my way. Okay, wise guy. Taylor? Escort Lieutenant Prescott back to the base and inform the duty officer that he's confined to quarters until further notice. Yes, sir. Now, get up. You can see how it is, honey. I'll phone you as soon as I can. You can pull all the rank you want. You're very good at doing that. But just remember this. You couldn't pilot a kitty cart across the other side of the street. If it weren't for guys like me, you'd be dead. Nothing. Why did you treat him that way? Right now, he has no business playing house with you. He's got a job to do, and that comes first. Not always, Commander. Dan knows what he's doing. Does he? I'm not so sure. you quit writing, my boy, Chuck? You disobeyed orders. Why, Twelve's a wreck, and we were darn lucky to salvage the instruments. All right, but you got to look at it both ways. Just think of the progress we've made. Come in. Yes, sir? Simmons, take this to Commander Barrett. Tell him I'll be there in five minutes. Yes, sir. I got something else here you can worry about. I'm putting Y-13 on a four-week countdown as of tonight. Four weeks? Yeah, the Pentagon just came through with a priority go-ahead. Are we really sweating blood to get this on time? All right, then sweat blood and read your orders. I have an apex to fire in 30 minutes. Pentagon is so impressed with your fame that you're to pilot Y-13. That's great. But you're not so very happy about it, are you? I just want to be sure of one thing, that there are no mistakes, that you obey every instruction given to you. Your reactions are slow up That's there. It's not the answer I want. What do you want me to say? I want you to say that you understand that you're the pilot, but I give the orders. Unfortunately, I think you'd do anything for this. Get off my back, will you? I'll get off your back as soon as you realize that we're developing a piloted space plane and not a record-breaking hero. All right. As I said before, your reaction is slow up there. No, we'll see to it that you get plenty of time for a checkout before the next flight. Dr. Von Essen will give you a thorough indoctrination so that your reactions are automatic. Now get your things together and get over to aviation medicine. Yes, sir. Francesca? Yes? What are you doing here? I'm sorry, Commander, but I'm in a hurry. What? Chief, what is Miss Francesca doing here? Checking in some material with Dr. Von Essen, sir. I don't understand you, Chief. What sort of material? Well, she's on Dr. Von Essen's staff, sir. Aviation Medicine Department. I wish she was working here. I'm all for scientists and skirts. Oh. You and the rest of the Navy. Come in. Commander Prescott, congratulations. 
Why, 13 should be a fine project. Oh, well, thank you, Doctor. Sit down. Cigarette? Uh, no, no, thanks. Um, say, uh, Doctor, do you, um, do you have a Miss Francesca on your staff? You do not visit us often enough at the university. How long has she been working for you? Some months. She has charge of the cardiographs and probably knows more about your brother's heart than he does himself. Yes, from what I've seen, I wouldn't be surprised. She's good for him. He's quieter, calmer, and in love. In love? Are you kidding? You're too close to your projects, Commander. You do not notice people enough. Are you sure of this? I should not say it otherwise. Well, what do you know? What sort of an idiot does that make me? Why in the heck didn't Dan say something? You don't seem to have your brother's entire confidence. No, uh, no, Doctor, I'm afraid I don't. You wish it were any other man than Dan who should pilot Y-13? Well, he's not the man I'd personally pick for the job. Why not? I just don't think it's in his nature to stay inside any organized pattern. It's not an unnatural characteristic to find in a man who risks his life for a new achievement? Maybe so, but on a project such as this, I prefer to have someone more reliable. Well, you will be my care until you are ready for the flight. I pay some attention to his psychology. Yes, would you let the psychiatrist work on him, Doctor? Make him understand that even though he's up there in space alone, he still has to obey orders. Attention all personnel. Stand by for Y-13 rocket motor testing. Again? I know it blind. I know. Let's go over it again, huh? Okay, okay. We blast off at 45,000 feet, crash the heat barrier, out into the stratosphere in six seconds. Fifty seconds later, I break through the chemosphere. Then you switch off your refrigeration plant. Check, but keep tracking me. Buffeting in Y-12 was so severe, I couldn't read my instruments. Well, that and the controllability barrier. Mm, yeah, that's really tough. There's much as you can do to hold on. You sure you can take over when you reach ionosphere? I mean, if you want to, we can take you past rocket furnace. No, no, that won't be necessary. Now that I know what to expect, I'll be ready. Y-13 countdown. Zero minus 54 minutes. Repeat. Zero minus 54 minutes. Well, Von Essen did a good job. You look pretty good. Never felt better. I wish he was coming today, though. I like to have him around. The Air Force has priority today. Y-13 countdown. All personnel assemble. All personnel assemble for takeoff. Well, good luck. And you take it easy. <laughs> Thanks, Chuck. But don't worry. I'll bring you back all the dope you need for Y-14, and then some. Come on, let's go, huh? Right. Six, five, four, three, two, one, drop! <laughs> Y-13 
13 to control. White 13 to control. Keep pressure gone. I'm weightless. But gyro's holding steady. Okay, Dan, we're with you. Now check controls for atmosphere bite. I'm checking now. Steady her up, that's enough. Take it easy, Chuck. Approaching 500,000 feet, check. Check. You're doing fine, boy. Now commence your turn in 15 seconds. Chuck, she feels like she'd go on forever. Stop talking, concentrate. 580,000. Ninety thousand. Six hundred thousand. Your altitude is six hundred thousand feet. Prepare to turn. Dan, Y thirteen, Y thirteen. Commence your turn immediately. No, sir, I'm going straight up. First man in this face. Commence your turn! Commence your turn! Sir, we're losing contact. Switch to remote control. Over to remote control, sir. Dan, are you reading me? Hello? See in space! Dan! Dan, are you reading me? Are you reading me? Remote control, no response, sir. We are atmosphere any second. He's still climbing. All radar to keep scanning constantly. Bring in everyone. Warn all spotters. This is an intercontinental priority. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Well, he's on his own now. The first man into space. He'll either hit the moon or orbit the Earth the rest of his life. calling from over 250 miles in space. My rocket motors have burned out, and my gyro stabilizers cannot turn me at this height. I'm going to use release mechanism to catapult myself and the nose away from the plane. Control, control, are you reading me? This is Y-13. Control, control, are you reading me? This is Y-13. Y-13, calling control! C, C. Yeah. Kalinsky. Yeah, yeah, sure. We'll take care of it right away. Yes, sir. There was some Mexican farmer called Sanchez. He says he caught sight of a parachute floating down. It landed just outside his farm. 
I don't know. He says there's something like a front half of a plane or something attached to the chute. Well, where's he located, sir? Just off Route 17, about 10 miles south of Alvarado. Look, you better get the nearest patrol car out there right away. Yes, sir. Meantime, I'll call the Navy base. It might have something to do with the rocket firing. Hello. Get me the duty officer at the Navy base. Call me back. Morning, Commander. Morning. Glad you could make it. I'm Wilson, Assistant Chief of State Police. Well, thanks for phoning in, Chief. Uh, whereabouts is it? Well, just up there a ways in the bushes. Any anyone hurt? Any damage? No. Dropped about a half a mile from the nearest farm. Mm -hmm. Came down like a dame in a feather bed. No, uh, no sign of the pilot, though, huh? Well, uh, you better come and look for yourself. What do you make of it, Commander? I don't know. It's uh, too early to say. I've never seen anything like this before. I'll have to go into the test lab. Well, the pilots had it, that's for certain. And the smash canopy, you mean, huh? Yeah, I couldn't live up there in space. You got a minute, sir? Why? Uh, could you come up and take a look at what we got up here? There's a farm. Are you okay? Oh, yeah, yeah, I'm okay. Salvage crew's right behind me. Oh, well, look, will you... Have one of your men stand guard. I've got to go in Albuquerque and make a call. Oh, sure. I'll be here myself. Well, thanks for your help. I'm always glad to help the Navy. What's the trouble? Oh, it's this Mexican farmer. He's had a lot of cattle slaughtered for no reason I can see. Well, let's go and see. Okay. into space with Dan as a pilot because those are my orders. Orders. Tia, Dan couldn't exist unless you were risking his life. If he weren't piloting Y-13, he'd find his own brand of danger somewhere else. He had to prove he was the best. If you knew all this, why didn't you try and stop him? I did. I don't believe you. I've been trying to stop him ever since we were kids. He was always climbing the highest tree or swimming further than anyone else. Oh, Dan, it was all the way or nothing. He wanted to be the first man into space. And he was. Before we lost track of him, he was higher than any man had ever been. Higher than any man? That's all you can think of. I wanted him to give up flying, to settle down. If he had, do you think he'd ever been happy? No, you're right. I just can't believe it's gone. I've got to get back to the base. Will you be all right here alone? Alone? Yes, I'll be all right. Well. Chuck, I didn't mean to blame you. Look, I'll um, stop by the aviation medicine department tomorrow and see you if you'd like. Thank you. I like that. Goodbye, dear. metallurgical tests. It seems as if the skin was subjected to some sort of encrustation we've never heard of. 
Any idea how high he went? Oh, and we can gravity pull, he could go a long way. Could be anything, 250, 350 miles. Should seem okay, as the usual signs of scorching. Yeah, the uh, automatic escape mechanism operated perfectly too. And this braking chute opened just right, as soon as it hit full atmosphere density. But it was too late to save Dan. Nobody could live once the canopy burst. He'd be dead in a second. Have a look over here. This incrustation has some remarkable qualities. You see? Nothing. Nothing at all. X-rays will not pass through it. No luck here either, sir. Thank you. This is the infrared photograph. <laughs> but the rays do not penetrate to show us what is below the surface. Then here, under the ultraviolet lamp. I can't understand it. It's resistant to any identification or penetration test we can do here. We'll take a photograph anyway. There may be some reflection we cannot observe, though I doubt it. Hmm. So far, then, your tests are negative. Well, let's hope the metallurgical report will give us a line. Let's hope. Let me know as soon as you have it. Oh, good night, Doctor. Good night, Chuck. Good night. Good night, sir. You know, you better get some sleep. I will, Skipper, thanks. What is this stuff, Doctor? Do you think a chemical breakdown could tell us anything? We do not even know the primary reactor. I sent a sample to my own laboratory. We may find the answer more quickly. You know, I, uh, I can't get him out of my mind, Doctor. I can just see him up there now in the cockpit. He uh, wanted you there today. Maybe if you had been. If only I had. You mustn't blame yourself, Chuck. Then you're right. Uh, look, I'll check with you first thing in the morning, huh? I'll do that. Thank you, sir, and goodbye. Come in. Hi, Chuck. Glad you came by. I want to talk to you. Have you seen this, Skipper? There's not the headline. Read, read further down. In the past 24 hours, death has struck in mysterious and terrifying ways. The type of wound inflicted is fearful and inhuman. Let's read the middle part, sir, where it talks about the slaughtered cattle. That farm is right next door to where Y-13 fell. I've got to call in now to Chief Wilson. Well, I don't get the tie-up. Yeah? Call for Commander Prescott, sir. Thank you, sir. It's Commander Prescott. Yes, Wilson, where are you? Alameda. What? Yes, well, I'll be there as soon as I can.
like I said, Commander, about the wounds on the Mexicans' cattle. You look, this one's the same. It's like a tearing jag there across the throat, see? Mm. Who or what could cause this wanton destruction? Well, I don't know, but it seems to like the taste of blood. You see, it, it looks like it's been scooped up or something. And look here, look. It takes more than human strength to do this. Unless he had an axe. Will you send a sample of that to a Dr. Von Essen in radiation medicine? Sure. You think they mean something? I don't know. I'd like to take a look at that Mexican's cat. Okay, we'll go over as soon as we're through here. Dozen more like it in the lower pasture. Mr. Muerta, que cosa terrible. It is a spietad. Who won't kill Clara? She won many prizes at Feria. You see what I mean? It's the same thing. The throat went right open. Hmm. Looks like it kills whatever comes near. Yeah. You have any idea what sort of a weapon could cause such a gash? No, not yet, but we're working on it. Anyway, shine your light. Mm. Oh, yeah. Those shiny specks again. Mm -hmm. Would you send a sample of this also over to aviation medicine? Well, sure. What are you trying to say, Commander, that something from outer space came out of that missile? Well, I don't know, but I'd like to have them compare it to the sample we took from the nurse at the blood bank. Okay. You think it's going to help us find the killer? Well, I can't say, but let's hope we catch it before it does any more killing. Well, I can't escape my roadblocks forever. But if you've got any ideas, Commander, you better let me in on them. What is it? it? Looks like a high altitude oxygen lead. I've got to get back to the base. I've got a lot of work to do. But don't worry, I'll keep in touch. Yeah, sure. Hello, señores. Quién paga a mi campanado? Hey, don't forget to keep my side warm. Don't worry, I won't let it get cold. Prescott, I'd like to see a Miss Francesca. 
I'll see if she's free. They're just finishing an altitude test. Commander Prescott to see Miss Francesca. I'll bring him down. Come with me, Commander. Thank you. Watch atmospheric density and final reaction carefully. Only 10 seconds to normal. Right, open the chamber. Good to see you. How are you feeling? All right. I've got plenty to do. It keeps my mind open. Yes, it does help, doesn't it? I uh, was on the way over to uh, see about some blood tests the police sent over this morning, and I thought I'd stick my head in and say hello. That's very nice. Do you want me to see if they're ready? I'd appreciate it. Thanks. Pathological? Hello? Are those blood tests ready for Commander Prescott? They are. Could you please send them down? He's waiting for them. Thank you. Well, it's fast work. We try our best. Do you want some coffee? Yes, I would. Thank you. Black? Please. Sugar? No, thanks. Fine. You look tired. Hmm. Well, maybe this will help. How did you ever end up in Albuquerque? I came with my father two years ago. He and Dr. Vanessa were very good friends. They were at school together. And uh, when my father died, Dr. Vanessa asked me to stay on and help him. What part of Italy are you from? Turin, from the north of Italy. Ever get homesick? Not anymore. Well, strange, first time I met you, I thought, well, it just goes to show you how wrong a person can be. Do you want some more coffee? No, oh, thanks. Right. Thank you. Better than both samples are innumerable particles of meteorite dust that show no sign of structural damage, such as would be expected from passage through atmosphere. Detailed analysis will be needed before a confirmed opinion can be given. The full report is requested on the origin of the dust. Has this got anything to do with Dan? I don't know. Uh, look, Tia, I've got to get back to the base. Uh, I'll see you again as soon as I can. Thanks for the call. Goodbye, sir. the results of the metallurgical tests. Hang on a second, will you, doctor? I'd like you to take a look at this. Later, later. Come over here. I want to show you something. This is a sample of our new secret alloy, of which the fuselage of Y-13 is made. You know the terrific heat and pressure it will stand. Yeah. This is a piece from the fuselage, which was coated with this strange substance. Notice, the metal underneath has not been affected. Now, this is a piece we removed from the stabilizer that has escaped being encrusted. Look, it has undergone a complete transformation. It does not even retain a resemblance to metal. It's like uh, crumbling carbon. And if I grind it, there's nothing left but powder. What could cause this transformation, Doctor? Difficult to see. Possibly cosmic rays we do not yet know or understand. The word is coded, this transformation hasn't occurred, right? Exactly. 
So then it could be that this is some sort of cosmic protection. Could be. Commander Prescott, report to Captain Richard's office, please. Commander Prescott, report to Captain Richard's office, please. I'll, uh, I'll be right back, Doctor. Although I accept your explanation, Senor Capitan, there is no doubt that it was providence that His Excellency was not killed. But the place where the tail section of Y-13 fell is ten miles from your town. What is ten miles, senor, when you do not know where your missiles go? What's he getting at? He's referring to the rocket that almost hit Juarez. <laughs> but that was a captured German V-2. It happened nearly ten years ago. What is ten years, senor? You still do not know where your missiles go. He has the whole story, sir. The low-flying projectile you lost over Argentina last year, the Apex missile that disappeared last week. That is so, senor capitan. Where are they, eh? As if I knew. If they're not up there, they must be down here. Glad you're here, Commander. Meet Senor Ramon de Guerrero, Consul for Mexico at Santa Fe. Mr. Yeah. Harold Atkins, State Department, Commander Prescott. Mr. Atkins? It seems that His Excellency, the Minister for Social Services, was opening a new boring in San Pedro. Uh, Senores, it was the moment of truth. The great silence descend upon the crowd. 5,000 people, 10,000 eyes, Senor Comandante, fixed on the blade. And suddenly there is a, a, a roar from space. It was greater than the roar of the Orlais that would greet the final triumph. All the eyes look up. When they look down... He missed the kill. Of course. Suddenly there is a tremendous... The crowd scatter, the bullies scare, jump over the barrera, nearly into the lap of His Excellency. And then the, the bull escaped and... The, wrecked at the market. They found what was left of Y-13 tail section later on in the day. Y-13? Yeah. Well, how soon can we get a salvage crew down there? Yeah, I'm yeah. afraid it's not quite as simple as that, Commander. There are formalities and uh, compensations. Yes, senores. Um, here is a list, senor capitan, but uh, is it not complete? Eh? 20,000 pesos! Must have been the bull of the century. Senor Capitan, it, it, it was a bull, <laughs> worthy of Manoletti himself. Senor Consul, I hope you will cooperate by allowing us to salvage the tail section. I will use my personal influence. Thank you. And the United States government will see about adequate compensation. Ah, Please you, impress upon His Excellency that both our countries will benefit from permission to send a salvage crew onto the crash site at the earliest possible moment. Of course, Senor Capitan. Well, uh, buenos dias, senores. Buenos dias. Buenos dias, senor. Oh, and, uh, Capitan, I hope the next time you lose a missile, you shoot it in some other direction. Eh? Boy, we fire a dozen missiles every week. Because something goes wrong once in a while, this kind of thing has to happen. Now, look, Chuck, Wilson's just called. Things are getting pretty serious. There have been three more killings. Three? Yeah. Did he give any details? Mm-hmm. A truck driver at a roadside diner just outside Los Alamos, and an elderly couple up by Green Valley. Well, Green Valley? Why, that's... How is it traveling those distances in such a short space of time? You can drive. Wilson found a truck with a steering column and foot controls bent so far out of shape it can't be driven another yard. Ah, yeah, beginning to get a picture. We know it has great strength. It's clumsy, smashes everything it touches. And it has mechanical knowledge. What makes you think this has anything to do with Y-13? Captain, I'd like to have you take a look at something in the lab. I think it's a... Excuse me. Captain Richards. Commander Lawson, sir. The S-21 rocket motor's ready on test bed number two. We fire in 30 minutes. Hold it. How long will you need me? I'll make it as fast as I can. Delay your test by one hour. Fire at 17.30. But, sir, we're all set. Look, it's about time you boys realize there's more than one baby in this nursery. Delay your test till 17.30. I can give you 30 minutes. Let's go. Assuming that there is life in outer space, it would have to create a protective coating in order to survive those destructive elements up there. You mean like the primeval creatures that crawl out of the sea and grew skin to protect themselves against the sun? Yes. Y-13 has penetrated a new world. So this coating was formed on Y-13 to protect it from those destructive forces in space. <laughs> it's an interesting theory, but I... But suppose the same thing happened in the cockpit. Let me show you something. You notice this is 
flexible and harmless to touch. Let me demonstrate on this piece of sponge rubber here. I'll wrap this around my hand. Watch this. This were human throat. That's how it could be slashed. And look closely into these gashes. Meteorite dust. The same as in the wounds of all the victims. Meteorite dust. So there's only one interpretation I can put on all this. This monster kills, but only because for some reason or other it needs this blood. No one has seen it and lived. What are you getting at, Chuck? I'm afraid this monster is Dan. <laughs> Say, that guy's off course. Yeah, he's loaded, okay. Here we go. Metabolism must have changed, but what form has it taken? Without knowing the kind of cosmic rays to which Dan was subjected and their effect on the physical basis of life, I could not say. Perhaps it caused a blood change. Boy, it's incredible to think of your brother as a blood drinking. Tia, would you get Dan's metabolism charts and cardiograms? We're going to need your help. Yes, I, I have them all here. Suppose when the canopy burst, his blood absorbed a high content of nitrogen. And he would die. The human body cannot survive in rarefied atmosphere without the protection of space suits and pressurized cabins. Yes, but you're forgetting about that protective coating on Y13. And if it formed quickly enough on Dan... Yes, it might have kept him alive. And if, instead of death, a new metabolism was created, which starved his body and his brain of blood. What then? We know very little. Only that by some mysterious means, the cells controlling growth and reproduction are changed by exposure to some cosmic rays. Beyond that, I could only guess. Yes, I'm only guessing too, Doctor. But I think Dan would be more at home in space than on Earth. And what has been going on hasn't been wanton killing, but only his need to replace this blood that has been changed. But he would need some proper transfusions. It would be useless to drink it. Yes, and unless he was obeying some animalistic instinct.
Your hunch was right, Commander. Look at this. It's Dan's space helmet. Where'd you find it? Not too far from here. In a car with his latest victim. And now we know what he looks like. A great, big, lumbering, deformed monster. Seems you can't kill him. The bullets bounce off. It's the coating. It's a perfect protection. Like armor plate. I've assigned a platoon of Marines to help Wilson. Look, I, I know he's got to be stopped, but remember, he's still Lieutenant Prescott. And, and if he can drive a car, he still retains some intelligence. He's not all monster. Well, what do you suggest, Commander? We just let him roam the state, killing at random? No, Chief, that's not what I meant. Well, look, we've got the works on him. The next time we find him, we'll try tear gas first. If that doesn't work, we can let the Marines blast him. Stands to reason, Chuck. If we can't stop him, we gotta destroy him. In the meantime, I gotta talk to Washington. Doctor, can you take me to your office? I want to get a long-distance conference line open. Of course, Captain. Come with me. I'll like you along, Chief. Chuck, why did this have to happen? Yeah, we're conquering a new world. The dangers have to be faced. Someone has to start. But why then? Who could stop him? I couldn't. Even though I tried, you couldn't either. No, I couldn't. No, though, you were right about one thing. It was a piece of machinery that I wanted in the cockpit of Y-13, not Dan. It is hard to remember sometimes that people matter more than machines. It is... <laughs> In there! Stop firing! Leave him alone! Let's get out of here and warn the others to stay away from him. We've got to get to Von Ness and tell him to open up a high altitude chamber. Where's your nearest PA system? Reception hall. You better get to Von Essen. I'll stick with Dan. Go on. Going the wrong way. Try and direct him on the PA system. I'll follow him. Look, Captain, why don't you let me call my men and blast him? Forget it. I'll take full responsibility. Dan, listen to me. You are in the wrong corridor. Remember the building. From the reception hall, you should turn right. Do not go straight off. Turn right. Dan, you have come a long way to find me. And I am very near. If you are following my directions correctly, you will be approaching the staircase leading to the high altitude chamber where I am waiting for you. Remember, you must turn left onto the staircase. If you are on the staircase, you are almost there. Then, Try hard to remember. The chamber is at the end of the corridor, leading straight from the bottom of the staircase. Take your time, Dan. I'm here, in the high altitude chamber, waiting to help you. 
come straight into the chamber. He's coming this way. Captain, open the door to the chamber. Larsen? Yes, Doctor. Take Mr. Wilson over to the atmosphere controls. Get as many recorders in operation as you can. the inside controls. I'm going in. Chuck, you can't. I've got to. Chuck! Mr. Vanessa, can you hear me? Yes, Chuck. Start overing atmosphere immediately. Take it up as high and as fast as you can. All right, Chuck. Proceed, Larson. Open in that valve. Allow for rise to 30,000 feet in 60 seconds. Dean Dan Chuck. Dan. Dan is Chuck. Your brother, don't you know me? Chuck, we want to. We want to help you. We want to help you, Dan. You know me? Chuck! It's Chuck! Don't you know me? Chuck? Sam, we're trying to help you. Sit down in the pilot seat. Sit down. That's right. Back up. Easy. Sit down in the pilots. Back up. Back up down. That's right. Look upon this. Give me some oxygen, quick. All right, Chuck. Dan. Listen. Dr. Von Essen is here. He wants to help you. Dan. I'm here at the window. Dr. Von Essen. Doctor, I've been searching for you. Everything seems strange and dark. I could, couldn't find you. Tell me about it, Dan. If I know what's happened, I can help you. Uh, under this stuff, I feel like I'm suffering from some terrible disease. Like I've got no blood in my veins. But the rarefied atmosphere we are giving you, it helps? Like clean, fresh air. I can breathe and think again. We're up to 30,000 feet. Can Chuck take any more? Be still, Chuck. Don't exert yourself. Take it very steadily up to 38,000 feet, but no more. Go on, Dan. There's not much to tell. I have no memory. Only an instinct to stay alive until I found you. I've been groping my way to a maze of fear and doubt. We're steady at 38,000. 
Hold it there. Jan, to find out what's wrong with you, I must make metabolism and blood pressure tests. All right, doctor. Tell us what happened up there in space. It was like running into the tail end of a hurricane. Only it was a stream of meteorite dust we hit. At first, it was like 50,000 machine guns, all hammering at once. First the canopy, then my, my visor melted. I thought my blood was starting to boil. Then this coating started to form. Fast, cooling and protective. But it was too late. The last thing I remember was pressing the button of the nose ejector. Then I, I thought I died. How high did you go, Dan? About 250 miles, maybe 300, I don't know. Chuck, did you hear that? Yeah, Dan, I'm listening. You thought I was kidding when I said I'd bring back all the dope you wanted? Well, I've got it all. With the covering of this stuff, Y-14 will be able to go through that meteorite dust Straight up. It will be able to go on forever. Rest, Dan. Rest. You can't breathe. Take it higher. Chuck, it's no good. We shall take him higher. But if we do, we kill Chuck. Kia. Yes, Dan. I'm sorry things had to happen this way. But you see, I, I just had to be the first man in this place. Right, Captain. Open the door. Dan is life. We go ahead with Y-14 soon. I wonder if we've learned enough. The conquest of new worlds always makes demands on human life. And there will always be men who will accept the risks.
It's intermission time, folks. So hurry, hurry, hurry. Step right over to our refreshment center for the most extravagant array of refreshment goodies ever assembled under one roof. Enjoy breathtaking, mouth-watering goodies. Everything from a snack to a delicious full meal. At our refreshment center, you'll find a large variety of goodies to satisfy your hunger, your thirst, or your sweet tooth. So hurry, hurry, hurry. Visit our refreshment center now. The show starts in 10 minutes. starts in nine minutes. The show starts in eight minutes. show starts in seven minutes. The show starts in six minutes.
show starts in five minutes. The show starts in four minutes. Show starts in three minutes. The show starts in two minutes. The show starts in one minute.
And now, on with the show. comes from. Okay, I'll see you later. Bye. You ever think of trying sleep instead of Benzedrine? You know, you might like it. Sure. Brother, I've had some tough nuts to crack in my time. Thanks. Uh, nothing like this. And to top it off, this guy has to go and get himself killed right outside the base. Hmm, if he was killed. What do you mean? Well, he could have died from natural causes, you know. Switch coming from a base security man. You fellows are usually suspicious of everything. Okay. Here's the sentry's report. And uh, this just came in from the FBI. It's what they have on the dead man, Grisel. Yeah. Jacques Grisel, 35, French Canadian, graduate of Toronto University, specialized in scientific farming, good war record, born in Toronto and went north for farming after the war. Has sister Barbara, age 24, living on the farm with him. Well, both the Grizzels got a clean slate. There's nothing suspicious about them. Yeah? 
What was Griselle doing in the woods at 3 o'clock in the morning? Farming? Cigarette? No, thanks. But what are you going to do now? Get yourself all involved in this business? Let the local authorities figure it out, Jeff. Well, the colonel doesn't think it's that easy, and neither do I. Besides, who can forget the look on that dead man's face? Now, look, there's probably some simple explanation. Hmm. I don't know. Maybe Doc Warren has the answer. He should be finished with the autopsy by now. Let's go on over. Okay. I've just been trying to get you. Well, what's the story? Sit down. I wasn't able to perform your autopsy. Why not? Because the mayor of Winthrop and a local doctor named Bradley, who's the coroner, too, came up and claimed the body this morning. Well, why didn't you call me? The mayor had already talked to the colonel. Oh, that's ridiculous. Well, what's the difference? They've got the body, so it's finished. Finished? Yeah, I wouldn't bet on it. They'll probably blame the death on our atomic reactors. Mm. It's his fear of radioactive fallout. We're not exploding atom bombs. We're just using atomic power for our radar experiments. Sure, go out and tell him that. You know we're a thousand miles from the nearest decent-sized city? Mm. What a bunch of backward people. They've blamed us for too little rain, too much rain, the blight, the beetle, even Mrs. O'Leary's ailing cow. That's why we have to have an autopsy, so we can prove that death wasn't caused by radiation. Well, the coroner said it was heart failure. That ought to do it. He's one of them. Well, you can't figure their minds, though. Excuse me, sir. Colonel Butler phoned to ask the Major to report to his office right away. All right, Mr. Mayor, if that's the way it is. No sense in asking you again, is there? No, sir. There'll be no autopsy. Come in. Oh, Major Cummings. Is that for me, sir? Yes, Major. I'd like to introduce Miss Barbara Grizzell and Mayor Hawkins, Major Cummings. How do you do? Major? Yeah. If you don't mind, Colonel, I've made up my mind. It's all settled. Just this one point. You know that our governments, Canada and the USA, have set up this base as a joint protection for our people. We know that. And we've told you that we feel that the refusal of an autopsy... Uh, sorry, Miss Grizel. Refusing to do it won't disrupt the effort. Miss Grizel? Mayor Hawkins? I'm no parlor diplomat. I'm an army man. I'm straightforward, maybe even blunt. But I'm afraid I must use stronger methods of persuasion. You recognize this, Miss Grizel? It's your brother's notebook. He's made some very interesting notations. Major, take a look at this page here. What's it look like to you? There's a timetable schedule. You note know the times indicated in each line? What is it? The schedule of our takeoffs and landings. That's enough to give me what I want, Miss Grizel. May I have a look at that notebook? Give it to her, Major. This schedule is a list of your takeoff and landings. Our herd's milk had fallen off in cream content. And my brother felt it was due to the jets flying overhead. That's why he was gathering this information. If you notice in the following pages, here's what it says. Helen, less nervous today. Quality low. Diane, apathetic. Quality poor. Mabel, very pert. General improvement. And so on with the other members of the herd. This was a daily reaction of each cow. Perhaps the colonel can tell us what he thought the items referred to. Well, I guess that's all we have to discuss. Thank you for coming. You know, the colonel's a nice guy, really, but, well, he does have his problems. You don't have to apologize for him. I'm not. It's just that he has a job to do. A difficult one under the circumstances. Please, I'd rather not discuss it. Okay. I was only trying to... Trying to what? Oh, I don't know. I guess I was looking for a way to say I... Well, I understand what you've been through. Do you? What the heck? I'm human. We're all human here. We're not monsters from outer space. <laughs> Thanks. What for? Oh, for the lift and the words of comfort. I wish I could do more. 
Have no hard feelings if that's what you're thinking. Well, I was, but not anymore. Sir. Now, Green Dog, Green Dog, this is Pyramid. Are you ready for Test Baker? Over. This is Green Dog. This is Green Dog. We are circling quite easily at 40,000 feet. Standing by for Test Baker. Over. Okay, Green Dog, commence Test Baker. Commence Test Baker. Over. Try starting out on the 500 mile range. Set for the 500-mile range, Sergeant. Master Scope, set at 500-mile range. Generator set. Position 6, Charlie. Start scanning, normal speed. Scanning, normal speed. Increase scanning speed, 20 RPMs. Scanning now, 20 RPMs. Increase range to 1,000 miles. Range increase to 1,000 miles, sir. Steady on your sensitive control, number three. Right, sir. Increase range to 1,500 miles. Range increasing to 1,500 miles, sir. Hold it steady now, Sergeant. Right, sir. OK, Sergeant. Increase to 2,000 miles. Increasing range to 2,000 miles, sir. Range increase to 2,000. Look, sir. Siberia. Increase range of 2,500 miles. Range increase to 2,500, sir. If we can keep this equipment working right, we can watch those Russians 24 hours a day right in their own backyard. We can spot any plane, any missile, anything that's airborne. Image is fading, sir. There it goes again. Same trouble. Well, green dog, green dog, this is Pyramid. Check your equipment. Our image is fading. Repeat. Check your equipment. Our image is fading. Over. This is Green Dog. This is Green Dog. Our equipment is working OK. Over. The signal's going out OK from here, sir. There's no drop in power. There must be some interference again. There's no other answer. We'll try increasing the power. Well, sir, we're pushing the atomic plant as much as we can now. We've got to lick this power fade. Tell them to pour it on. Peterson. Well, Pete, this is Cummings, Master Control. We want you to give us everything you've got. But, Jeff, we've already exceeded the design limits. Every time you take a test, you ask for more power. If I take any more of those rods out, the reactor's liable to get out of control. Well, take some more out. We'll have to risk it. We've got to have more power. Mine, too, probably. Yes, sir. Remove ten more rods from reactor number three. That's crazy, sir. Yeah, I know, but it's an order. has been boosted, sir, but still can't increase image further. It doesn't matter how much we boost the transmitter power, it doesn't reach the plane. You know, it's almost as if the power were being drained off. Well, we'll just have to keep working on it. 
Yeah, and in the meantime, what new excuse do I give the Pentagon? This is Green Dog. This is Green Dog. Standing by for instructions. Over. Okay, Green Dog. Okay, Green Dog. Test Baker is completed. Return to base. Repeat. Test Baker is completed. Return to base. Over. Roger and out. Okay, Sergeant. Let's close shop. Jacques Grisel's sum of good overshadows the other. What has he marked up in the ledger for good as against the ledger for bad? He was a good, generous man. His word of service. And now we consecrate the worldly remains of our beloved Jacques to the good earth from whence he sprang. Closer and closer. Thank goodness the cows are getting used to them. Aye. Are we eating soon? It'll be ready in a minute. I just want to feed the chickens first. See you home, Barbara. No, thank you, Mayor. I think I'd better go back with Professor Walker and keep my mind occupied. Are you sure you want to? My work can wait, you know. Say, Mayor! Mayor, Ben Adams and his wife are dead, same as young Grizel. Where? Up at the farm. At the edge of the air base. Mayor Hawkins, you're taking a great deal for granted. There is absolutely no evidence pointing to radioactive fallout or radioactive contamination of any kind. Yes, we'll do everything we can, I assure you. Yes, yes, goodbye. In addition to our headaches with the Pentagon, we're now being accused of killing off the people in this town. Perhaps they'd cooperate, sir, if we could explain more about our anti-missile program. I mean, not the secret stuff. You know but... that's impossible, Jeff. Come in. It'll be rough if the town turns against us. Sir, we began a complete investigation of the Adams farm, but the local constable, a man named Gibbons, told us to get off the place. Said it came under his jurisdiction and we had no business being there. What kind of cooperation do you call that? Well, they're nervous, upset. We've got to find out how those people died. Well, suppose you get hold of the Adams relatives. See if you can persuade them to let us do an autopsy. Yes, sir, I'll try. Reassure them. Promise them anything. But get hold of those bodies. I made a complete autopsy in both cases. Call Dr. Bradley in to check my findings, and our opinions concur. It's fantastic. On the examination of the skull of Mr. Adams, I noticed two small holes in the base of the occipital region here. They penetrated to the medulla oblongata where the spinal cord meets the brain. I opened the skull to investigate and found this. The brain, it's gone. Yes, sucked out like an egg through those two holes. That's not all. The entire spinal cord is missing. But it, it's incredible. It's as if some mental vampire were at work. Where's the brain and spinal cord gone? I'm a doctor, Colonel, not a detective. There's nothing like this in the books. Major Cummings had the best explanation so far. Mental vampire. That's rubbish. 
possibly some animal. Colonel, or... Colonel, I've lived in these backwoods all my life. And I can assure you there's no animal in these parts or anywhere else for that matter that could do that. Maybe that guy Gibbons was right about the supernatural. Well, whatever the explanation, we'll find it. We must find it. In the meantime, Doctor, I trust I can rely on your discretion. Not to tell the mayor or the townspeople. Mm -hmm. Of course, I've got an overworked practice as it is, Colonel. Thank you. Dr. Warren, I want you to get on the phone. Consult the top medical specialists, wherever they are. Yes, sir. Captain, contact the best authorities. Tell them what the problem is. Find out what they have to say about it. Jeff, the townsfolk know you. Talk to them. Check on anything that seems to be extraordinary, no matter what it is. Grizel? Oh, Miss Grizel, I, uh... Great. Look, um... Miss Grizel, I, I'm sorry for, um, barging in like that, but, um... Uh... Well, I knocked and there was no answer, and then the door was open, so I... Make yourself at home, Major. I'll be out in a minute. Uh, thank you. Just um, glancing around. That's all right. Professor Walgate was preparing these for publication anyway. Oh, well, are you correlating his material? I do most of it. He dictates on this. I edit the tapes and prepare the draft manuscripts. Mm, some job. Mm, but interesting. Well, the professor must be quite a guy. Thought control, cybernetics, all that stuff. Mm, that's only half of it. That's strange, isn't it? Finding a man like that here in, uh, in Winthrop. In these uncivilized backwards, I think you were going to say. Well, I'm afraid so. Well, the explanation is quite a simple one. Professor Walgett had a stroke about five years ago. He's retired now. Oh, he still works. Mm, and at odd hours. Odd hours? Mm, he thinks nothing of starting work at 11 at night and working until the small hours of the morning. Hmm. You know, the mayor mentioned that Walgate was an authority on psychic phenomena. Is that still a hobby of his? I don't know. If it is, you'll have Dr. Bradley after him. Dr. Bradley said no more overwork or excitement. What about you? What do you mean? Well, don't you ever get some time off? Well, sometimes. Hello, Howard. Come on in. Oh, this is Major Cummings from the base. Um, yeah, I know. We, we've met. Well, uh, I guess I'll be running along. Well, you've only just been here a few minutes. Oh, I was just passing on my way back to the base. Quite a roundabout route. The new airfield extension covers a lot of ground. Too much for Winthrop's like. It must keep you pretty busy. Yes, yes, there's a lot to do. I bet there is. Come again. You found that GI killer yet? You know, you'd be far better off hunting him down instead of tomcatting around here. This is busty. <laughs> Oh, 
hope I didn't break anything. I think you'd better leave, Major. You've done enough damage for one morning. You tell me you haven't known me long enough. Yeah, okay. Okay, I'll see you later. How do you like that? She says we haven't been properly introduced, and she's a nurse. Well, we'll be made out better with the museums and stuff. No, not a chance. They all think I'm crazy. How'd you make out? Listen, now, we've got work to do. Uh uh. You're the guy who works after five, remember, not me. Now, wait a minute. This is serious. I want you to give me all the information you can on our Professor Walgate. Everything he's ever written books, articles, everything. This guy and jump by tomorrow night. So long, Mayor. nonsense. No fancy atomic radiation caused these deaths. What about the mayor? What killed him? Who are you trying to fool, Gibbons? It's the atomic fallout. Yeah, 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 yeah. Hold it, hold it, fellas, hold it. Someone murdered the mayor. The same maniac that killed Jack Grizzell, Ben Adams, and his wife. All right, Gibbons, where is he? If you'll shut up, I'll tell you. Right there, let him talk. Now, the fellow we're after is out there in the woods. Probably some air-based GI that's gone wild. Now, we can't get far if we move fast and I say, let's stop jabbering and get after Wait, him. Wait, let's get him. All right, now, let's go. Right, fellas, let's fight this guy. Sharp lookout, okay? Okay, let's go.
Excuse me, sir. This just came in from the FBI. Hmm. Walgate. Brilliant scientist, recluse, considered highly eccentric. That old guy, Walgate. He sounds like a cross between Einstein and Robinson Crusoe, sir. It's more interesting all the time. Okay, Sergeant, I'm going out for a while. Nice to see you again. I'm very busy. Well, I'd uh, like to see the professor. Oh. Yes, of course. Thank you. Come in. Professor Walgate, Major Cummings from the air base to see you. Sorry to barge in like this, uh, Professor. Not at all. These days I welcome any excuse to stop work. Isn't that so, Barbara? Please take a chair, Major. Oh, thank you. I, um, I came to see you about this, this business with the mayor. Oh, terrible tragedy, really terrible. Yes, I need your help, Professor. Anything you say, just name it. Well, this is the fourth death in the space of a few days. Uh, not only are they terrible tragedies in themselves, but they're turning the townsfolk against us at the base. It's just ignorance, my dear fellow. These people are simple, one might say. Narrow in their outlook. Of course, the very secrecy of your activities doesn't help. This development of radar boosted by atomic power. What gave you that idea, sir? Well, there was a piece in the Atom Journal about your work on reactors. It wasn't a year ago when I read somewhere about the new radar patterns. Of course, this territory's ideal for that kind of work. I put two and two together. And made five? So we say four and a half. But you don't have to worry, Major. What I surmise, I keep to myself. Well, I hope so, sir. Well, let me offer you a drink. Whiskey? Uh, yes, please. Uh, straight. Barbara. Uh, no, thank you, Professor. I'll have the last chapter finished tomorrow. That's fine. That's real progress. I've already begun on volume two. My mind is fairly buzzing with these strange <laughs> words. Just a few elementary ideas on the subject, Major. Not so advanced as present-day developments. I'll transcribe these while you talk. Excuse me. That business of her brother, she was devoted to him. Yes, it was a tough break. I don't want to seem morbid, but did you see his face after he died? Yes. What was it like? I have a reason for asking. Well, it, it was an expression of complete horror. Fright. Almost insane, I guess. Did you get him? What kid? Okay, fellas. Okay, okay. Get him? No, just a false alarm. That's all. As you said yourself, sir, the people here are simple and superstitious. Maybe they're not so wrong after all. What do you mean? Hmm. About the supernatural? Something unreal? Something never seen by anyone before? I can't accept that. I've always disproved such theories. What is it then? Nothing supernatural, I'm sure. I can't believe that. I'm a scientist. You've made a study of psychic phenomena, haven't you? I tell you, it can't be that. It, it can't be. Professor, you know what Dr. Bradley said. Was it absolutely necessary to upset the professor? It, it, it's nothing, nothing, Barbara. The Major and I were just having a quiet talk. I got dizzy. Well, your quiet little talk is over, Major. First Howard Gibbons, now the professor. Do you have to go around making trouble? You really believe that, don't you? Well, I can believe my eyes. I'm sorry, Professor. I didn't mean to disturb you. No, not at all. 
Forgive me if I don't rise. Yes, certainly. Excuse me. It's me! It's Burke! Have you finished searching the quarry yet? Yeah, the men are tired. They want to go home. But they can't quit now. We've almost reached the air base. Well, you better tell them they won't listen to me. Okay, fellas, you spread out again. We'll join up at the Adams fence. Say, you hear something? Yeah. Funny sound. You take that path, and I'll take this one. And if you see anything, shout. You said not to let each other out of sight. These paths run almost parallel to each other. We'll meet up a ways anyway. The dawn's beginning to come up. Wait a little. We'll see better then. Oh, we're close to the end. Now, come on, boy. Go on, fella. You take that one. I think you should go home, Mrs. Gibbons. No. I'm all right, Doctor. I'll wait here for my boy. Don't worry. We'll find him. Oh, where's Howard? Where is he? We've searched everywhere. Yeah, he just disappeared. Oh, I don't believe it. He must be there. I'm going to look for him myself. You can't go in the woods alone. Oh, but i got to find him. I've got to find my boy. Oh, you'd better see that she gets home. Get your wife to look after her. Have you searched the woods thoroughly? We kept calling for him. If Gibbons is out there and still alive, he would have heard us. No point in searching anymore. I reckon we ought to call a council meeting and decide what we're going to do. Yeah, what about it, Bradley? Well, let's get Melville. He's the deputy mayor. I suppose it's up to him. Good evening. Everyone quiet, please. Now you all know why we're here. We've had four deaths, and now our constable has disappeared. The cause of these deaths is still unknown. Everybody seems to have their own ideas, and they all seem connected with the new air base. Now you're talking. For this reason, I've asked Major Cummings to this meeting. He's going to help us in any way he possibly can. That goes for his commanding officer, Colonel Butler, who is very concerned about what's happened. Cut out the soft soap, Melville. Let's get down to brass tacks. All I know is, before this air base came here, we were doing fine. Now you and these Air Force fellows tell us that it's not radiation at all. Well, maybe you're right at that. I don't know. But forgetting about the deaths, how do you explain the change in quality of the cow's milk, even the quantity? Let the Major tell me about that. Go ahead, Major. Well, no one can make anyone believe something if they don't want to believe it. 
but it has been positively proven that there is no radiation affecting anyone in Winthrop. Mm. Not even the cows. As for the milk, I don't know enough about farming, but I would assume... Rizal did. He knew his business. And so do I. It was the noise of the jets that did it. Nothing more. It frightened the herd. But I can tell you that the herd is normal again. They've got used to it. Thank you. As for the deaths, gentlemen, we are equally at a loss to give an answer, and equally disturbed. Now, there's been some talk of a mad GI on the prowl. Well, this, I can assure you, is not true. We've checked and rechecked our personnel. We know how you feel, but we're trying to protect our countries from a guided missile attack. If you would only help us instead of fighting us. Uh, it's all a waste of time. Let's get rid of the base. We had no trouble before they came here. We'll have no trouble after they leave. I think that's rather foolish, Adam. Jeff, what could have happened to him? I don't know. Would you like a drink? No, no, thanks. Barbara, I think Professor Walgate is involved in these deaths. I don't understand. No, neither do I. Maybe it's just a hunch, but his background, his training. Oh, Jeff. Look, Barbara, I've checked on Walgate. This, uh, this research of his. Somehow, I think it ties in with what's happened here in Winthrop. Oh, that's crazy. Is it? Mind if I borrow this? Where are you going? I'd like to take a look at your cemetery.
Any word yet from Major Cummings? Not a thing yet, sir. Well, keep trying. Hello? Uh, hello, Miss Grizel. This is Captain Chester. I've been trying to locate Major Cummings. Well, he left here about 7.30. Well, did he say where he was going? Yes, he, he borrowed a flashlight from me and said something about going to the cemetery. Look, I don't like the sound of all this. You wait there. I'll be over right away. place all right Me, buddy, it's Barbara. Well, there's a lot in there. No air. Take it easy now. Come on, let's get going. We'll, we'll get Wait, you back to the base. No, I, I gotta see Walgate. Yeah, no shape to see anybody. I've got to see Walgate. <laughs> Come in. Good evening. Major Cummings. For Barbara. It's very late. I hope you don't mind, sir. Oh, on the contrary. I'm glad to see you. Sit down, won't you? We, uh, we missed you at the town council meeting. I saw Gibbons afterwards. His mind was gone completely mad. It's dreadful. I was hoping maybe you could help us, sir. Me? How, how could I help you? You're an atomic expert. Who told you that? Our files in Washington. Have you been checking on me? Yes. Oh. Here, would you, um... Did you care for a cigarette, Professor? Oh, no, thanks. I'm attached to my pipe. Uh, Professor, I read one of your books on the uh, materialization of thought. Uh, you denied that it was possible, but the thought was intriguing. Yes, if it could be done, why, man could create power by thought. He could will a door to open. He could perform useful work without moving from his chair. Practically anything. I said it was impossible, mm. didn't I? Is it? Perhaps with atomic power it could be done. Oh, please, I'm tired and sick. Stop badgering me, please. I will if you'll answer me a few questions. Jeff! I'm sorry, but I've got to go on. What were you doing in the cemetery tonight, Professor? Were you, um, looking for this? I didn't mean to shut you in, close the door on you. I was frightened when I heard you. I, I only wanted time to get away. I only realized later that you might be shut, trapped. I, I called Barbara, but she If gone. she hadn't rescued me, I wouldn't be alive. Jeff. What were you doing there, Professor? I had to examine the mayor's body. I had to find out the truth. What was that? Professor, what's the Professor, matter? what's the matter? Yeah, sit there. Professor, can you hear me? It's a terrible story. Shut down your atomic plant, Raider. Call Dr. Bradley right away. I'm going back to the base. Jeff, be careful. I'm afraid. I'll be back right away. I'll try that again. We'll have more time. But the thing's fantastic. You can't shut down a whole atomic power plant on such a wild theory. Well, you can't deny the facts, sir. Grizel, the Adams couple, the mayor, they all died a few minutes after the peak of our radar test, right after our atomic plant was operating under full power. 
But it'll take months to get the plant operating again. Well, it's better than risking any more lives or madmen like Gibbons. Okay. Let's put it on ice. How soon you'll be ready, Pete? We'll shut her down in five minutes. The rugs are all smashed. What happened? I don't know. We just found them all broken. We'll never be able to shut her down now. What about spares? You know how we put this place together, Jeff. We've no extras of anything. Well, there must be some way of controlling the reaction. Well, the rods, we don't stand a chance. The nearest supply would be at the Hanford Works in the Columbia River. How soon can we get a shipment flown in here? Oh, four to six hours, if you phone right now. Get me the Hanford Works on the Columbia River right away. Well, Doc, how is he? Oh, there's no question. It's another attack a little more serious than the last. He'll be all right. Oh, sure, sure, sure. See, he gets plenty of rest. Call me if there's any change. For goodness sake, get somebody out here to stay with you. Jeff, um, Major Cummings said he'll be back soon. Jeff, Major Cummings? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Obviously, those rods were destroyed. How and for what reason, we don't know. But we do know that we're in trouble up here. Serious trouble. Hello. Yes, put her through. It's for you, Jeff. Barbara Grizel. Thank you. Hello, Barbara. OK, good. We'll be right over. Right, bye. Walgate, you're gaining consciousness. I think we'd better get over there right away, sir. Right. Now, we better get some sidearms. Check. Casper. Get hold of Dr. Bradley and Melville right away. Have them meet us at Walgate's house. I shall feel better after I've told you everything. Maybe you can help me to clear up this ghastly business. But no matter what you do to me, remember those horrible deaths were beyond my control. Go on, Professor. For many years now, I have been working on a theory of thought materialization. The entire apparatus to give it the required boost is in my laboratory. Laboratory? Didn't know you had one. There were many things you didn't know, my child. If you had, you'd never have come here again. You can see it later. But I knew I could never succeed on the principles of telepathy. I needed to stimulate my brain to the extent that I could detach thought from my conscious to give it a separate entity of its own. I concentrated on the simplest experiment to turn the page of a book. I designed an instrument to create a sudden and powerful electrical boost to help me free my thought. But each application of the electric charge created a shock almost equal to electrocution. It made me ill. Dr. Bradley diagnosed exhaustion. He thought my illness was caused by overwork in getting my papers ready for publication. He introduced me to Barbara Grizel. With Barbara as my secretary, I was able to satisfy my publisher and continue my experiments to materialize thought. For a long time, I persisted in this one experiment without success, until one night. Striking the house gave my instruments a sudden violent charge of power. And my thought was free. Free to turn the page of a book. I altered the design of my equipment to generate these violent power boosts. But it was very dangerous. And I could only undergo each experiment after a long period of rest. Whenever I felt well enough to absorb the shock, I found no difficulty in moving small objects. Eventually, I developed a certain tolerance to the high voltages I used. But what I really needed for regular experiments was a new form of power. 
something that was smoother, something that would flow through my brain without causing collapse. The new atomic plant at the air base provided me with this power. I devised additional apparatus that enabled me to divert a portion of the atomic power that was radiating between the ground station and the radar aircraft circling 40,000 feet above. It was power which I could control, and I learned how to amplify my thoughts without hurting myself. I was able to detach my thoughts and allow them to work on their own. I began to devise a being into which the thought, once released, could enter and preserve itself for all humanity. I envisage something akin to the human brain, with life and mobility, but without the limitations of man's body. I concentrated my entire thought on its creation. I succeeded, but like thought itself, it was invisible. That night I entered my laboratory to take advantage of a radar test, only to find the place in shambles. My equipment wrecked beyond repair. All of my notes about its creation and how I thought it could be controlled were destroyed. I knew now that I had created a fiend. There was no other explanation. I was helpless, but whom could I tell? Who would believe such a fantastic story? I could sense the presence of the fiend there in the room with me, growing more powerful with each succeeding day. My one desire was to destroy the thing, but I possessed no means of projecting my thought to do so. Then I could hear it. Was it possible that there were more than one? I was unable to stop them. They were now drawing power from the atomic station. Its intelligence had expanded. Now knew how to make its escape. And then followed these horrible deaths and Gibbon's madness. I had to know what I had done. I had to see one of the bodies. I went to the mayor's tomb. I now know that I have created a mental vampire. A fiend that needs to... Drain the intellect to survive and multiply. I'll get it. Supposing you're right, Professor, how does it live? How else but in the brains and nerve centers removed from these dead people? Then where are they and why can't we see them? This is nonsense. We're facing a new form of life that nobody understands. I believe it feeds on the radiation from your atomic plant and that it's evil. Professor, it's my opinion that the evil's all in your mind. You're in need of medical assistance. Ah, oh, Doctor, I'm glad to see you're here. This man's become a raving lunatic. Hey, what's going on out there? Hey, look! Hello. Hello! Professor, what's wrong with your telephone? Nothing should be the matter unless they've got enough intelligence to cut the lines. Jeff, I want you to get over to the air base. I want emergency patrols. <laughs>
Captain, give me a hand. If we'd only see them, we'd know what to do. Is there any way to make them visible? Not that I know, unless it's a question of the amount of atomic radiation that's available. Get a hold of yourself. Why are they so quiet? Maybe they're going to leave us alone. I doubt it. But they've just put out a burst of energy. Perhaps they need to rest. Colonel Butler. Yes. How long does it take to shut down your atomic plant? Why? If my theory is right, then without the radiation of which I was speaking, these things must die. Good grief. What is it? What do you see? Let me through! Hey, Jeff, Professor, they're becoming visible. Someone or something must have increased the power of the atomic plant. What have I unleashed? Ghastly, it's horrible. Oh, you can say that again. It all ties up with what Dr. Warren explained to us, sir. Look carefully. Get those sidearms. I'm sure it's the atomic plant. So long as it goes on, they will multiply, getting stronger and stronger. Now yeah, we'll see about that. Well, anyway, they're mortal. To stop them. There's only one way shut down your atomic plant. Unless we shut off the radiation, we'll all be destroyed, and heaven knows how many others. Well, sir, there's a dynamite shed between here and the plant. If I can get through, I can blow up the control room. Well, if that's the way it's got to be. I'm afraid it is. Jeff! Must it be you, Jeff? Yeah, I, I know the control room layout, they don't. Be careful, Jeff, please. Yeah, and be sure to lock this door. He can't go alone. He won't last a minute amongst those fiends. It's too late, Professor. Anyway, somebody had to get through. Then cover him as he leaves the house. And shoot straight. Don't waste a shot. You see him? No, not yet. You can't! 
it's suicide. By my creation, perhaps I can control them. Give Jeff a chance. Lock it after me. No. Take it easy now. I know that guy, and if anybody can get through, he can. It's been so long since Jeff left. Don't even think about it. It's so quiet. I wonder what they're up to. Colonel, we're almost out of ammunition.
Captain, let's get started. Doc, I'll send you some help over as soon as I get over to the air base. Thanks, Colonel. What about Jeff? He's been gone for hours. It's okay, honey. It's all over. Well, Major, I'm leaving you in charge. Report back when you have the situation well in hand. Good luck, Jeff. Thanks, boy. Well, Doc, I hope now that we got this thing licked, you'll, you'll encourage your people to cooperate with us. Well, I reckon we owe it to you, Major. And it strikes me you uh, are setting a very good example. <laughs> Place the speaker on the post when you leave the theater. Please replace the speaker on its rack when you're ready to leave. Failure to do so will damage both the speaker and your car. We'll be grateful, and so will the patrons who follow you. <laughs>